six fifteen. That's when you check them. <laughs> hey guys, it's Chad <laughs> from the Teach Better team, and I'm here with. Someone who just ran an amazing mastery chat, Victoria Thompson. How Hi. are you tonight, Victoria? I am great. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. So you just finished a mastery chat. Uh, we yes. were just talking about how crazy fast these chats go sometimes, but that usually happens when the topic is as awesome as it was tonight. And the topic tonight was deprogramming educational norms. And I think this is such an important topic because I think every single teacher in every single classroom needs to be thinking about their norms that they have, the biases they have, and what they're coming into this year with. Um, so what what kind of, what was your motivation for this topic? Yeah, yeah. Um, so to be candid, a couple of things happened to Ooh. get me to Point. Um, so I just started a new role as a STEM instructional coach, which is very exciting. Yeah. And part of thank you. And part of what I do specifically with that role and the organization that I work with is, you know, using you know problem-based learning as a vehicle yeah. for equity um, and infusing STEM in authentic ways in schools. And then also at the same time, making sure that we have equitable experiences for our students. The reason why I have that job now is because in my old institution, which I love, love, love to work at, there were just a couple of conversations that were happening during that time, especially with like the protests, you know, and Black Lives yeah. Matter. There were a couple of conversations that led me to believe that it might not be my best place for growth. I really enjoyed working there, like I seriously did, but there were a couple of things that were said where I was like, uh, I just don't know if their mission aligns well sure. with mine. So yeah. I sent in my resume uh, to a, just a couple of different places, you know, just to kind of get my bearing, because if I wanted to work at the organization, I still could or not the organization. Sorry. Sorry. My previous institution. I was like, I can totally do that. But let's just kind of see what's out there. You know, I got five minutes later. They contacted me for an interview and just to kind of feel yeah. out the position. And, and then by the end of the week, I got the job. So it was a very like whirlwind, you know, type. That's of, awesome. Right. Like getting a job. But I was like, all right, this is really cool. But just within that journey of having those discussions, you know, getting the new role and now molding into this new role. I myself have done a lot of deprogramming because I so I taught in South Carolina um, and then I was working at like a private independent school. Both places, although lovely, were very much entrenched in a lot of this stuff with the educational norm, sure. which really made me think about what I did in my classroom to deprogram that, right? And then also made me think about what other teachers are doing as well to deprogram it. So especially with you know virtual learning on the horizon, teachers going back to school, there's no better time to have this conversation. I agree. Wow, there's, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, there's yes. a couple of things that I, I, I really kind of like um, connect with a lot of the work we do and that kind of I inherently connect with. And that is, um, I spent my career in a STEM school, so I love PBL, I love project-based mm -hmm. learning and all of those things. Um, but I also feel like when you give students autonomy and ownership, you're providing a more equitable, more equitable environment organically, right? Mm -hmm. So like, allowing students to follow their passions through things like projects you know a lot of our work is in the uh, pbl but also mastery learning self-paced learning so those those things as well and um it's when you give students a, a little bit more freedom that they find themselves in the learning right and when when you're giving them that room is when they can really sort of that's when you create that equitable environment so i love the fact that you mentioned how you can create equity with good instructional practices that are inclusive and engaging for learners, right? And I think that's something that gets, I, I feel like we see them as two like buckets yeah. sometimes, like equity it's and instruction. As like either or instead of both and, when yes. they pose yes. this, then like, like these things can pose this. You can have equitable instruction, decolonize your curriculum and still be a good teacher, not at the expense of what you're supposed to be taught. And I find a lot in just secondary environments, there's a lot of, well, we're not gonna do this at the expense of the curriculum, right? Or so like I was at an IB school where there's like a certain amount of things that need to yep. be in before the IB test. For sure. I've seen those syllabi, yeah. 
we can have equitable practice and equitable instruction and in, and have these things in our curriculum, not at the expense of what we're supposed to be teaching. So I always yeah. view my like curriculum guide or like my pacing guide as like the my testing syllabus instead of my sure. teaching syllabus. And then that, like that. has been just completely changes the viewpoint. And now that I'm a coach, and I also write curriculum myself, my master's is in yeah. curriculum reading. Oh, okay. Like I, I explicitly state in every curriculum that I write, this is your testing syllabus, not your teaching syllabus. And even though these are the standards and these are the things you need to hit, you like here are some cool ways to infuse like non-Eurocentric thinking, you know, yeah. alternative effects, alternative assessment, right? And that kind of goes also with the framework of white supremacy traits where like, I don't want everything to be like worship of the written word. If a kid can um, make a project or tell me how to do a math problem or like a science experiment, then a lab paper, even though like we will do them from time to time, it's not, again, the only way, which is another, you know, trait of white supremacy framework. So I really do a lot of work making sure that these things are debunked and yeah. deconstructed. Yes, I absolutely love that that last point you made about the fact that like the syllabus is a, a, a testing guide. It's or the curriculum is a testing guide, not a teaching guide. So it's like the because the teaching should be sort of a, a, an authentic experience for the students, an organic experience for the students, uh, an experience they can connect with and engage in, right? As opposed to sort of like just this list or um, checklist of, of standards and, and, and targets and everything else. So I absolutely love that you love that you mentioned it. And, and you are right, especially in these higher um, higher ed. I think um, when we talk about later middle school, high school, I think we get some of these entrenched norms in classrooms. One of the things you brought up tonight were sort of like the idea of like behavioral policing, right? Um, this yeah. idea um we like our job as teachers is to change behavior of students right as opposed to like teach them and inspire them and um I, I, I that really hit home for me right because you also talked about um how students show mastery and that was another thing you just talked about in the fact that maybe they're not strong writers but they can draw a picture or draw a diagram do a project right and I talk to teachers incessantly about what are you assessing? Because I've talked to like English teachers before that will go, I need a student to be able to make an, write an argument. But then they grade a bunch of grammar on the paper. And I go, hold on. Do they have a sound argument? Is it backed with evidence? Is the evidence cited? That's what you're measuring. You're not measuring grammar right now. So like, I think it also comes from a planning and a curriculum and a lesson planning design standpoint where you have to go, know what you're measuring and then be true to that as opposed to bringing in all these biases and other norms, right? Like you didn't say this how I would have said it, or you didn't phrase this the right way, or you didn't use the right punctuation. Well, if you're not grading punctuation right now, the student should be penalized for that, right? right. So I a thousand percent agree with that. Um, so, so how, as a teacher, I'm sitting here and I'm going, I'm reflecting on this chat tonight. I'm reflecting on your fantastic questions. And if I'm in our audience and I'm and I'm thinking, by the way, I want to say hello to Olivia, Jeff, um, Jeff Kaplan, Lindsay Titus is here as well. We got people coming in out oh, of the we woodwork. See, or actually probably you can see, but I can't. Can we see like who's here right now? Um, I can see the comments. I can't see the oh, list of okay. people. I can't see the list of people. So we do Got have it. some people saying, hey, um, <laughs> Facebook user, I don't know who that is, but they said great chat and it was a great chat. You did an awesome job. Livia Chan did an amazing um, job in the chat as well. Um, but I, let's talk for a minute about um, unacceptable disruptive behavior. Uh, an example that I always go back to is sort of like a student working but sitting on the floor, right? Like mm -hmm. um, I had students that did this in my own classroom and I would, I would never really I would never really correct this behavior because if they were comfortable, they were focused and they were working, why would I want to disrupt that? Right? Like my thought was if you're working and you're comfortable, like let's, let's do that. Um, and, and I had a great conversation one time with, with, with a colleague that says, well, you know, why do you let them, why do you let them do that in your classroom? 
I said, well, first of all, they're being productive, they're learning, they're growing, and I'm building trust. And I don't want to ruin that with by demonizing the way that they think they should work. Also, you know, I don't know what how they work at home. Maybe they get you. Maybe they're used to sitting on the floor and working, and that's how they're comfortable, right? Um, and so, I I think taking these things as a perspective is, is so powerful as a teacher. Um, what are some other like examples or things that like you see really commonly that teachers are just jumping all over students for that they really just need to like reevaluate? Uh, I don't even know where to begin. Uh, I, well, I know there's a lot. Like, I knew, so I, I knew I just pried open the can right of worms that, that <laughs> is this discussion. But like, if you right. think about like three to five most common things that like right. you think teachers should maybe reevaluate their stance mm -hmm. on. Uh, so, I, I was just curious. I'll, I'll speak from my experiences with working in both private and public because I think that they're both valid in this space. My number one that I cannot wrap my head around is uniforms. And mm -hmm. I, yes. I'm a product of New Jersey K through 12 public education. I never went to a private school. I went to a public college for both my like graduate and my undergraduate degree. Like uniforms and dress codes were just not things that I ever had to deal with. And then when I worked at my private school, it was like a different world. And and there were different levels of uniform. There was dress uniform. There was uniform. Right. There was spirit wow. day. like yes, yeah, so like for spirit day, you can wear different colored socks and different colored shoes, but you still had to wear like your skirt or like your pants and like your shirt for dress uniform. It was like a little, like a, like it was like a wool, um, words are escaping me right now. It was like a sweater vest. So it was like a wool sweater gotcha. vest, a white, you know, shirt underneath and it had to be collared and, and you had to wear, you know, like leggings or, you know, socks. And, you know, I worked out of public schools in South Carolina where sometimes we were just happy if the kids came clothed, right? Like if they were just clothed I'm with you. Yeah. About. And that was or a very appropriate. Yeah. Like, right. So they were like warm enough. Yeah. Right. And so, so again, being candid, sometimes I would get emails like, well, well, somebody was egregiously out of uniform. And I heard that, you know, she was in your room or, you know, so-and-so was wearing pink socks. And to me, I'm like, how is them wearing pink socks affect what they're doing in my room and, and how they're learning? So I was definitely not a stickler for the uniform, not nearly as much as some of my colleagues were. That did get me into a little bit of heat. But at the end of the day, I was like, this is, I mean, it, it might be a school policy and I'm always down to follow school policy, but I just kind of turned a blind eye because there are so many Love other it. things that are more important than. Yeah, where, like, I had the same thing where, with like hoodies. Socks, right. You know what I mean? I like if, like, yeah. I also think that dress codes and uniforms unfairly target girls and young women, um, especially agree. in the private school yeah. environment. You know, skirts have to be a certain length. You know, shirts have to be up a certain height. You don't really see those same restrictions on boys and young men. Absolutely. So that's why I, yeah, that's why I really am not a stickler when it comes to uniforms or dress codes. Now, if it's to the point where, like, the student is uncomfortable, or maybe if there's something inappropriate, sure, right? Sure. If there's not like balance on it, that's where I'll draw the line. But no, like for I'm the with most you. Part, yeah, for the most part, I'm like, if you're comfortable and if you're not being disruptive, you know, or and if you're learning, then totally cool. So that's you know, it. that's it. Yeah. Un uniforms I don't get and I don't think I'll ever get. Um, another thing when it comes to schools um, and just kind of like disruptive behaviors. I never got the whole quiet in the hallway thing. And when I say that, I mean specifically like walking in a line quietly, like on the side of the hall. I think that there are different ways to get from point A to point B and not necessarily have to be quiet as a mouse, but still being respectful of other people's space. And I find this an interesting dichotomy because you know, in high school, there are, teachers don't walk you from place to place, right? Right, and right. So even when I taught at the middle school level, as teachers, we had to walk kids to and from electives. I in have a experiences life. like this, I, absolutely. Yeah. When I was growing up um, and when I was in middle school, we did not get walked from special to special. So I don't know if that's like a shift, you know, that's recent or maybe that was just where I worked, but I did find it very interesting and um unique that I had as the yeah. adult to kind of still be monitoring and managing kids who I thought that at that time they should still be able to kind of police themselves. 
um, you know, not to use the word police, but I think that they totally should have been able to get from point A to point B. And then, yeah. of course, in high school, you know, class schedules are different. There's like a million kids in the hallway. There's nobody saying walk in a line. So I would just like to see more continuity because eventually they are going to have that release of responsibility. Sure. They, you know, they have to be able to handle it. And we as adults need to break that stigma of the only way to get from point A to point B is walking in a straight line. Um, so that's number two. Number three, I would have to say like disruptive behaviors like tapping your pencil, moving out of your seat, um, calling out. These are all things I always find with teachers to be like when it's a very teacher centered classroom and not a student centered classroom. Of course, there are times and places where that's not going to be appropriate. Right. Like if I'm speaking or if I'm helping another student, like one of my big pet peeves is when kids like tap me on the back when I'm working with somebody else. So I kind of have to redirect that attention. But these are not like disruptive behaviors. These are just kid behaviors. Right. So it's our job to create a space and create a culture where it might not be like the norm. Like, I don't think that kids should be calling out because then, you know, it gets kind of hard to hear people, but we can facilitate meaningful discussion. We can also facilitate instruction ourselves that's, you know, is student centered and authentic because I don't think that these things should be seen as disruptive. Like if I, I think I have a pencil. I do have a pencil in front of me. If I need to sharpen a pencil, why do I have to ask a teacher to get up and do that? Sharpening a yeah. pencil takes five seconds and it's not going to be that disruptive. It's something that I've never understood and I don't think I ever will. Um, so those would probably be, I, I know I just talked a lot, but those are my top three no, that I I'm just don't enjoying listening at this point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so no, no, I, I, I'm right there with you, right? So the three things you mentioned were um, dress code, talking out, and walking in a straight line silently, okay? I, I really, I, I gravitate towards the silently one. I think that applies to like in the classroom and that kind of goes to the calling out as well, right? Um, like if you have a group of silent students in a classroom where just the teacher's voice is being heard, that is a 100% passive learning environment in a teacher-centered environment, right? So now we are creating this teacher centricity where which I think actually was a lot of where this stems from, right? Like this need to like control because the, when I work with teachers on letting go on some of those reins, kind of a lot like you probably do with PBL and letting them do more open-ended assignments and have more ownership, right? It's, a, it's like the same idea of like when I'm getting teachers to let go, it's getting them to let go of that control, right? Because yeah. often a classroom or a project is running is not a silent classroom. It's an engaged. It's an it's a uh, it's a meaningful learning classroom, right? Um, a classroom that's self-paced and student-centered is not going to be a silent classroom. Um, and the idea that like if a classroom's quiet, those kids must be engaged, or like that teacher must mm -hmm. have good management. Mm -hmm. No, that right. teacher's a tyrant. Like like that's that's the only I'll thing that teachers. Student teaching. So like my my cooperating teacher was was awful, awful, awful. Um, but I was observing in some other classrooms as like part of transitioning out. And there was a second grade teacher who had like this rule where like you stay silent, like you are quiet. They were the quietest second graders I think I've ever seen in my entire life. Yeah. They didn't talk e even when they were collaborating with each other. They were like pointing and like using cards like there was no communication at all, at all. And it really put into perspective for me, like the lack of experience they were getting in that classroom. And I think that as adults, sometimes we kind of normalize like noise level ourselves. It's so, like, for example, I've got a dog who I like post about all the time. And like he sometimes is in the window and if someone walks by that he doesn't recognize or notice, sometimes he'll bark. And then like, of course, it's annoying to me, but I have to remember like he's a dog, right? That's what dogs do. They're going to bark if they see something yeah. that's not clear to them. We have to think of kids in the same way. And I don't like to compare kids to animals, but I think that sometimes- No, no I get the point you're, tolerate, you're making. I, I see the point you're making yeah. now, yeah. What we tolerate as adults is entirely different from what the threshold is for kids. Kids are going to talk. Kids are going to be loud. Kids are going to ask questions. They're going to be animated. You know, they're going to be kind of busy, you know, is how I describe it. 
just because we're kind of phased out of that as adults and we've also been conditioned to view these as negative behaviors in the workplace, you know, in, you know, personal relationships, romantic relationships, kids are still kind of figuring that out, you know, what's appropriate for them, what their comfort level is and what's not their comfort level. We can't expect for kids to act like how we do because like I'm 26 and I'm working with an eight year old. <laughs> so the yeah. eight year old, going to have the same emotional intelligence, spatial awareness, you know, like noise control as I do. And it's not our job as the teachers to police it, but it's our job as the educators and the teachers in the room to give outlets, to create a space for students to feel their authentic self. That's yeah. So much awesomeness just came out. I don't even know where to begin or to even come <laughs> back to. No, that was absolutely absolutely fantastic um so i i don't want to keep you all night victoria i know you have some some delicious dinner waiting for you that i think you're <laughs> you know, just attempting to, yeah. to, to cook right me, um, the most interesting time to learn how to not read a recipe <laughs> yeah. i've just kind of been like going back and forth between like my yeah. office <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So let's. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm gonna kind of try to wrap things up a bit here, and I. I, I think I'm gonna end with this question. And this is. I. I like to end these with a very pretty simple question. I'm a teacher. I just heard all the amazing knowledge you just dropped on our entire network. Um. I just experienced this awesome chat. I was reflecting all night. What do I do tomorrow? What do I do in the coming weeks before the year starts? What are some first steps? And I think you've mentioned a couple as we've been talking, but like if I'm going to do something tomorrow to rethink my classroom, like what would be your like gut reaction for like a, like a tip to give someone? Yeah. Oh, so I actually do this um, quite a bit, right? So I've got, and I've actually gotten myself into a bit of trouble with this with some friends because- I mean, the best you know, ideas get us in trouble. Right, yeah. <laughs> they will, you know, read White Fragility, you know, they're attending the seminars and the conferences. Yeah. And that's just kind of where the conversation starts and stops. And then I, of course, follow up with, well, then what are you going to do? And then instead right. of hearing, what are you going to do? What they hear and internalize is, so I hear that you're mad at me because, you know, because I haven't, you know, blah, blah, blah. So then that also requires a little bit of, you know, conversation and programming, or programming literally, because I'm not deprogramming. I am, I am programming to say, because I'm questioning you, I'm not mad at you. I am legitimately interested in what are you doing next? You know, you've attended the conferences, you've done the chats, you know, you've read the resources. What are actionable next steps that you can take yes. to be a better learner, be a better educator? Because racism and white supremacy and like all of these norms that we kind of have in education, it's not going to be solved in a summer. It is going yeah. to take much longer than a couple of different things in order for you, you know, to, to, to do things, right? So yeah. what I always people is that it's okay to start small like tip number one it's okay to start small you don't need to move mountains with what you're doing but even little things like somebody in the chat tonight mentioned that even small things like having diversity in word problems how many times do you see names like john jeff lily amy but you don't see names like um now words are escaping me, uh, but, 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 but you know, like with sure, like the Jamal names, or, yeah, like I'm thinking right, of some right, of my old Jamal, things. So, yeah. Tyreek, right? So yeah. many of the teams are Eurocentric and it's just little things like that, that bring visibility. And I know that's like bare minimum diversity, but it's a start, right? So it it's is. okay to start yeah. small. The second thing that I always encourage people to do is go directly to your institution, wherever you're working, and then what I usually do is I'll find people that are kind of on board and we'll kind of create a task force or we'll start the conversations, but then going directly to the institution and saying, here's what I'm noticing, right? Here's what I'm noticing. What are we going to do about it? So like at my last institution, one of the questions I still don't have an answer to is when did we integrate? 
you know, we were a private independent institution. When did we integrate? When did we get our first student of color? And to this day, I do not have an answer. I think every single institution should be able to answer that as well as questions as to how are we retaining and recruiting faculty of color? How are we making sure yeah. that our spaces are safe for faculty of color and students of color? If these questions are not either addressed or explicitly written into mission statements and have a task force, that's a problem. So as an yeah. educator, as teachers, we can be the you know, the change, we can be the movement, you know, create a task force or a group of like-minded educators who are at least starting to have conversations like this. And if you don't have any at your institution, which does unfortunately happen sometimes, there are tons of people on Twitter, professional learning networks and other networks that are more than happy to help you mobilize. You know, we're all kind of in this space together and we're all remote anyway. So we're always <laughs> yeah, happy. Right now. Yeah. And then third, Third and final with that, taking a look specifically at your curriculum, you know, your respective curriculum and figuring out what you can do to do what I call decolonizing it. So like for yeah. me as a STEM educator and a former math teacher, a lot of math embodies those white supremacy culture traits, you know, things like worship of the written word with like, you know, most math tests being like paper, pencil, perfectionism, you know, which is why I use anonymous platforms like Pear Deck and Buncee that kind of take away that stigma of being up on the board and, and being wrong, right? If they're not right, then, then they internalize the mistake. There are things that you can do within your curriculum slowly but surely that decolonize some of that and make it a more accessible curriculum for your students. Wow, fantastic. So if people want to stay connected with you, learn more about you, kind of work with you, like what, what's the best way for them to reach you? Yes. So I've got my Twitter handle. It's at Victoria the Tech. I'm pretty active on Twitter, but I do check notifications like in the morning and in the evening <laughs> because now that I'm an instructional coach, I do work over the summer a lot. Um, so yeah. that's yeah. the best way. You and every instructional leader in the country is going overtime right now. <laughs> right. Even though I don't have like the capability or capacity to make a lot of the decisions like regarding remote learning, I have 100% empathy for anybody tasked with making these decisions because it's really hard. It's really hard. Uh, however, you do have the privilege of creating the bridge to get educators exactly. to work within that environment, right? So I, I actually truly believe that the work that you're doing is absolutely fantastic and amazing and I applaud you for it. Um, um, I have a true belief that with quality instruction that is student centered, we can close the gap between whether it's remote in the classroom or somewhere in between, right? Um, if we create student centered learning environments, whether it's with PBLs, whether it's with mastery or self paced learning, whether it's with, you know, equitable learning practices, like when we put these things in place, learning doesn't become place centric. It doesn't become the, something that can only happen because you're at a geographic location at a, at a specific time during the day, right? It becomes mm -hmm. an immersive experience that continues beyond the walls of the classroom. And I really think that's what a lot of teachers need right now. And I'm so glad that you help teachers kind of reevaluate some of these things tonight. Um, we definitely have to talk more because um, yeah. you're pretty awesome. I just, <laughs> I don't know when that's going to be. I'm pretty sure you're going to be on our podcast soon as well, which I'm pretty excited about. So, um, so I'm, I'm going to listen to that episode a couple of times, I think. So um, <laughs> you did an absolute great job tonight, Victoria. I want to thank you for taking the time and waiting for your dinner. Please apologize to your wife on behalf of the Heat team. Um, it's all uh, good. And if, if your, if your wings got ruined, you can blame them. Out, okay. Is that fair? And said that they looked good. So I think that at this point they're just in the warmer. So now, yeah. of course, I'm the so I'm the cook in the house. I cook everything for the most part, <laughs> and then Courtney is like the cleaner and like the tidier and the organizer. So she 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 actually texted me. She was like, "I think that they look done." I'm like, "Just, just leave them out. <laughs> Keep them in the warmer." So we're we're gonna see how they turned out. <laughs> All right, well, good luck with your wings, Victoria. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for joining us, and have a fantastic night. Yes, thank you. Have a good night. Bye. <laughs>